Oh, hi, Pat. I was just on the phone talking to one of the other folks out there, and uh, that was Christy. I think you probably know who she is. Uh, anyway, she was telling me, she said she made contact with the IRS, and uh, she said that she got information from them to file a 1041, and that that was all she needed to do to get her ball rolling. And um, I kind of felt that, uh, well, I'm not that familiar with this stuff uh, to, to be able to make a call on that. Although what, the way she was describing it sounded pretty reasonable. And I told her I was going to have another um, uh, interview with you this morning and I would be able to post that. A lot of people were pretty eager last night on the call to hear what you had to say as an update. So uh, what's, uh, what's your recent update on uh, what we've been um, working on? Well, basically I sent uh, documents in uh, last Friday for uh, uh, a 1099A and also uh, transferring money out of my bank over to my living trust uh, using the 1099A okay. uh, for about $470,000. Now, uh, one of the questions that came up yesterday at the local uh, meeting was people thought that the Living Trust was vulnerable and it had holes in it that they felt that it would be easier or better for a person to do an irrevocable trust. How do you feel about that? If it's private, it's private. I mean, what the heck? Yeah. Uh, basically, if you do an irrevocable trust, basically you're going to... Uh, uh, have to put it out into the public. Oh, is that right? That's the way I think it is. Private trust is private. All right. Or can't touch a private trust. Even those interfacing with uh, the IRS? I mean, is that... Interfacing with anything. Okay. Okay. Basically, you're dealing with real money, and basically uh, you can have access into uh, money in uh, the public bank or whatever, but it's nothing more than a private safety deposit box. You take, you, you have, you own that box, even though it's sitting in the bank. Mm -hmm. You can't take the box with you. You could, uh, you, it's yours while you're paying the fee for it. They can't go in and open that box up. Did you feel that um, <clears throat> in order to change your status, uh, are you still with the idea that the CAP uh, in combination, would you think that the 1041 of the CAP is the way to actually do that? The thing that people need to do right now, and uh, I'll send these over to you, well, I sent them over to you, is uh, listen to that uh, Pat Talks to get your money, okay? okay? I was telling people how to go in and get their money out of uh, some money right now by going in and doing it 1099A mm -hmm. from your bank. You are the bank. Okay. It's your Social Security accessing uh, number. Okay. Then you are going to be the borrower. Your bank is the lender. You keep both the B and the C copy. You put one copy over to where your bank's records are, and you put one copy over to where your individual records are. You send the 1099A cover sheet in, and it has both blocks, the lender and the borrower. They both are filled in with the Social Security number. Mm -hmm. No living individual sees that. It's scanned in because you're using the scanning document. Okay, so all they do is open up that letter, uh, see that it's red, go through the scanner. They don't look to see that both numbers are the same. Interesting. So then all you have to do is turn around and say, okay, yeah, I put down that basically on line two, I want wanted $250,000. Line four is going to be the same amount. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Do I need to pay it back? No. So you send that in with a ten, or you send in a ten forty to claim that money. All you do on that is you just fill out line sixty one, the total column, uh, how much was overpaid, and then how.
how much you want back. Did you say line 61 or is that line 6? Line 61. Okay, line 61. <clears throat> and what did you say about line 61? <clears throat> Just line 61 is where you report how much has been withheld of that 1099 form. And it's what you put in block 2 of the 1099A form. Okay, that 250000 then. Yeah, so you would put that in there. You go down, total that column up, 250000 You go down and uh, where it says how much you overpaid, $250,000. How much do you want back? $250,000. You go down and you sign it as the fiduciary uh, and say, send me the money. And would that be the, uh, like in a check or a money order where you can you put could it? You could have it either wired to your bank or you could have it sent as a check to you. It's coming out as real money. Yeah. Real money. Yeah, just like you were saying about the B, when you convert the the, the FRNs or a check, uh, you convert that into a barter uh, of where it becomes pure credit, just like the one that they would issue, right? Yeah. You're basically going back and... Uh, merging the check. You could probably also do it by writing closed check on the check that you get from the company. But it's already come out from the company, but I don't know whether they do it on the return or whether when it is issued out. Uh, it might be on the return. So if you wrote closed check on that check that came from your uh, company, uh, that would close that check. They could not monetize that check. It would have to be real money that you're getting paid with. That's what the closed check was all about. Now, in regards to using a 1099A with this that you just got done describing, is there is there any repercussions like the 1099OID? Uh, can anything come back on you on this? No. In other words, they couldn't deem this as being a fraudulent conveyance of money? No. Not if you've got your Form 56 in. You're the executor of that account. Now, if you get carried away and write a check out for $25 billion, your account may not have $25 billion in it. I see. Okay. That could be considered fraud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, what what, what type of, uh, what's your latest uh, idea that are in this account? Uh, Approximate. That you wouldn't have to really worry about, but don't get carried away. Use it in practicality. Yeah. Because that's what it was set up for. And basically use it to defend the country and defend what you really want. You don't need all this 25,000 room house or anything like that. You need to have something that you're comfortable means. You might want to have two houses, a north house and a south house. Go north in the summer and south in the winter. Or you might want to do it the opposite way. <laughs> mm -hmm. You might like the real hot in the summer, and you might like the real cold in the winter. <laughs> um, going back to using this formula, uh, is uh, you know, the last time I spoke with you, you had to change your status. Once you change your status, this will work? Or do you have to change your status in order for this to work? Or where are you at with uh, that whole package? What status are you talking about? Well, you were talking about changing your status with a CAP, and Christy was talking about changing her status with a 1041. And between the two of you, I can see that both of those forms have possibilities. Uh, do you have to have a change of status to be able to get your hands on $250,000? Or can you just point blank as a human being fill out this form just like you just got done saying and, and actually get results? Or uh, can you give me a little input about that? Yeah, that's what I tried to put out with that one when Pat speaks about getting your money. And that document that I sent to you, that word, okay. or that audio. All right. It uh, basically lays it out. All you do is you have to have a form 56. Right. You, when you turned 18, you became the executor of the Social Security account. It's a dry accessing account. It's nothing more than a combination lock on your safety deposit box. So you have to open up the combination to get 
it into your uh, bank account. And it's nothing more than a private bank. And you're the only account in that bank. I see. It's your private bank. Now, since it's a bank, it's one of the many banks of the country. And all those little mini banks of the country form the Central Bank of America. We are the Central Bank. Part of it. So all we have to do is go in, do the 1099A after we've done the Form 56. And that's and on the Form 56, you have to do Part 1C. Part 2, <laughs> Item 1C. And that's where you uh, mark that this was a trust document and that you were assigned the executor of that when you turned 18. That was your assignment date. And then you're going to become the fiduciary over this uh, Social Security Trust, and then you sign it as the executor. I see. And so then you have to send a copy of that out to where you're going to send your uh, 1040 form so that they post it on the wall and says, okay, uh, little Christopher, Christopher Summers here can access his account. Mm -hmm. That's our cashier's ID card. So we fill out, we're going to go to our bank, okay? We're the president, the executive officer of our bank. We're going to go to ourselves. But we have to approach ourselves with a invoice. What do we want to borrow this money for? So we give them a document. Which is a invoice. 1099. That's a 1099A, right? <clears throat> well, that's an invoice. Oh. You make out one. So much labor. I did 25 hours of work this week. I want to get paid. <clears throat> Some more on that one. I want to go out and buy a farm. $3 million to buy this farm. You put it down on an invoice, a private invoice. So what you're saying is, is that we can bypass the general bank and actually have access to our own accounts. Therefore, any time that we're issued uh, an invoice, we can submit that under a 1099-A for payment, and therefore they send us the payment. You can claim to your own bank you put that over to them, you sign it, and say, send me the money back so that you, as the fiduciary, are going to be the borrower. You're going to borrow from your own bank. Ah, oh, got it. So okay. the borrower and lender's numbers on that 1099-A will be both the same, the same Social Security number. It belongs to both the bank and you. And the bank would actually be the fiduciary. No, you are the fiduciary. The human body, the esquire, the the son of the soul, is the is the fiduciary. The bank is just the bank. It's the, it's our five commissary. Oh. Our living trust, or our not our living trust, but basically our American and state, uh, like my case. Uh, American Iowa uh, Fide Commissary account because there are both shares of stock from the country and the state uh, in that commissary. Now, has anybody actually had success with this formula? I just sent it uh, mine in. They got it uh, just yesterday, so I should be hearing back. It should be a three day turnaround, so the check should be back in the mail uh, no later than. Uh, uh, We'll say Thursday. And when um, is part of the idea of getting pure credit? In other words, when you get this, uh, which is not an FRN debt instrument type of uh, payment, <coughs> you have the abilities to, to, to utilize that uh, into gold and silver uh, without uh, any. You don't need to worry about gold and silver. Okay? okay. All right. Get that. Okay. You just take that, deposit it into your checking account. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nothing happens to it then. It's when you write a checkout at that point in time, 
you'll write closed check on that check. That means that they cannot monetize that check. That check goes out as real money. It's that simple. Hmm. You want to pay with real money? You want to operate with real money? What is real money? People don't even know what it is. They don't even know how the money system in this country works. All uh, wagering bets, every signature you make on a check, and you have not closed that check, that is a three-year wager bet that is out in circulation. They write bonds off against that account. They put your asset that you have in the bank off to the side. They created the Federal Reserve dollars, and they have to pull those Federal Reserve dollars off the books in three years if you don't come forward and pay for it with real asset. And is that what uh, Greg Gentry was saying, is they take that and put it into the Costa Rica uh, bank account down there? No, I think that's all total bullshit. You think so? <clears throat> uh, I think it's still right here. Uh, now, down the road, yeah, they do stuff uh, that they're depositing their stuff that they've gotten uh, out of the system, but not our stuff. <clears throat> in, in other words, uh after three years, does that become a, a principal and uh, it accrues interest, or does it stay as an interest separate from the original principal? How does that work? Uh, I mean, have you figured that out yet? I mean, you're going to have to sit down and look at the 1099, learn the, learn the ABCs. Yeah. I've got it laid out on, those, on that document and the American Remedy okay, I'm, on there. All right. Those two documents over. I've got a chart laid it explaining the monetary system there. All right. Uh, so what I'll be doing is I, I've got some catch-up. I was sick last week, so I was unable to get to anything last week, and it was probably good that you didn't call last week. I was just, uh, you know, not feeling well. But um, what I posted yesterday yeah. was on the 1099-C. Okay. The ten people go in and cancel the debt. Okay? You have an IRS bill come to you. Mm-hmm. Basically, you have to get them to pay you first. Well, first you operate with them, as, and you're going to be in the right of discussion. You submit the 1099-C in canceling the debt that they owe to you. But you have the right to pick up any interest that they have identified. That's what goes in Block 3. You cancel the debt there, then you can pick up with the 1099A the amount that is in Block 3 on the 1099C. Now, you give them, you cancel their debt. If they're going to be a good servant, they have to cancel your debt. If they're a bad servant <clears throat> and still want to come after you, you turn around and you do a corrected 1099C and say, okay, you pay us everything that you owe us first. Then we will pay you. Because oh. we are the creditor. They owe us first before we have to pay. <clears throat> I see. Yeah, they're the ones the governments are the ones that are still under bankruptcy law. So, Better. if I if I've got you right, what you're saying is that you can ask them to be paid first before you cancel the debt. Is that what you're saying? No, you cancel their debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're going to cancel their debt. And it's just like 2,000 years ago when Jesus was talking about the good servant and the bad servant. Okay? The good servant will cancel the subservant's debt. <coughs> now, if the bad servant, if you cancel the bad servant's debt and then he stole, still holds the person beneath him to a debt, he's a bad servant. And basically the bad servant got punished. We can punish these guys. We will turn around and do the full 1099C and make them change it from, in Block 5, from, no, they don't have to pay the debt back, to, yes, they 
paid claiming the whole amount from them. Let the IRS turn around and go and get the money for us. Right. Um, what, um, are you engaged with any calls, uh, or would you like to maybe strike an evening uh, to have a call, and I could put it out on lawlearners.net to have anybody that wanted to come to that call? Would you like to do that, or so, or are you having calls right now? What are you doing? Well, Destry was trying to get me on a call Saturday night mm -hmm. on uh, that uh, line up there. Oh, you're talking about the, what is it, um, uh, the radio? Uh, uh, real American radio, whatever that is. I yeah. Think. But they charge, I think, for their audio, so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I could probably make an arrangement if you're in agreement to that. Uh, I think that this is, uh, I'm going to be, I, I told Darren over there at Law Learners that uh, I'm going to be posting uh, because people have been asking for these radio, uh, I mean, the the, um, the interviews that we're creating here. Uh, and well, I would post those other ones that I just sent you over. Yeah, I will. And uh, th I told Darren last night that I needed to get to him, to talk to him, to get this stuff posted out. And, and I told everybody on the, call, the last uh, two or three calls is that they can go over to Law Learners. So people are expecting these calls to be posted over there along with the documents. So I have to give instructions to make it obvious for everybody that's a member over there to get your, because people have been climbing up and down <laughs> asking for these things. And uh, when I get busy doing other stuff, I just really don't have the time. And I, I feel bad because uh, if I just put it over at Law Learners, then it's done. Then anybody can go over there at their own convenience. So that's what uh, what's in the plan right now. But if you wanted to do a spot or if you've got a uh, somebody that wants to put you on the air, why don't you let me know so I can post that over at Law Learners, and that way everybody can get to the call to listen to you. Well, uh, I think right now if they would just listen to those latest ones that I told them how to get their money, Okay. Uh, that talks about the 1099A. Okay. And uh, either going with the 1040 or the 1041 form uh, to get the money. I did uh, one uh, last Friday for $479,000 to transfer it uh, from the Social Security account to my living trust. I had to send that one into Ogden, Utah. That's where the 1040 form goes, or 1041 form goes. Or the other place is to Cincinnati, <coughs> 1041. So again, you have to do a form 56 for the fiduciary over that uh, trust, mm -hmm. that living trust. So you're going to have to do it for Form 56 when you do uh, the first time you send one of those 1041 forms in. Monday, I sent another one out logged in Utah. I sent the 1099As down to Kansas City because that's where my uh, 1099As have to go to with the 1096 forms. Mm -hmm. I sent that in for $3.2 million to buy a farm. Uh, so I sent that one out to Ogden, uh, and then I did another one uh, for $221,000 uh, against my, uh, as an individual. Well, how come people I, are not utilizing this a little more? Off? I mean, is, is this so new that people haven't been able to offset their mortgage payments or mortgage debt? I mean, can you give a real quick synopsis? Would you do a 1099-C for a mortgage and then do a 1099-A to get the money back? Is that how, what you're saying that people should be doing with their mortgages? Uh, basically, uh, on a mortgage, okay? If the mortgage is over three years old, it's fully paid for. Mm -hmm. Okay? Fully paid for is what they did. For the first three years of a mortgage, you are the creditor. Okay, you're the one that really loaned the money to the bank to go out and basically buy that house. They turned around, created that amount of money of Federal Reserve dollars. That is in circulation. At the end of three years, all those Federal Reserve dollars have to come out of circulation. 
they turn around also and write bonds, put a secret lien against your five commissary, using it as collateral for the bonds that they write. They write at least 10 and right now up to 35 times the number of bonds. They're drawing interest <laughs> off of that. If it was the original 10 bonds that they could write, they would be getting 50% payback per year. So at the end of three years, they would have gotten 150% of that original loan that you had. They would take 100% of that, pay off the loan in full for you. They would give you 0.375% per bond per year, put that into your five commissary account, and they would end up with about 13.3% profit per year for doing nothing. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, during that three-year time frame, since they created 10 times the amount of dollars out in the circulation, they caused inflation. They drove up the prices of everything, mm -hmm. making us pay more inflated prices for something that we wanted, trying to destroy us <clears throat> more. Now, if you come forward before that three years is up, you can do a 1099A paying the full thing in full value, okay, setting it fully off. Then you turn around and you claim the interest back as abandoned property of what you have paid in out of your back pocket, plus the interest for the time frame that that has been held there. <clears throat> so you're doing a... Uh, uh, owed to you. <clears throat> so a 1099 acquisition would be to pay it off fully, and a 1099 abandonment would be to collect the monies that have been accrued. Now that you have already paid out of your back pocket that you shouldn't have had to pay. Mm -hmm. Then, after the three years, it's fully paid for. Uh, you would turn around and basically take that contract and do a crucifixion of it because they turn around and made you the creditor. That you have to be able to know what the hell's going on with the monetary system. That's why I tried to lay it out in a graphic <laughs> format, that everything is settled at the end of three years. M1, M2, M3. There's no M4. Mm -hmm. Well, um, is off. What, what if you got a mortgage that's after three years? What document would you file in order to go ahead and cancel out the debt? And even if a person didn't want to receive any money back, uh, I mean, there's got to be a simple form that you can cancel the debt. Is it a 1099-C? Or uh, how would you go about doing that after three years? Yeah, you would turn around, submit in a 1099-C, and say, basically, this debt has been fully paid for <clears throat> to a 3949-A into the IRS about fraud, about uh, conspiracy, and basically you would take <clears throat> that you have and do a crucifixion, draw a cross on it. Ah. Yeah, I remember you saying something about the cross. Yeah. And basically you're going to crucify that because you are not the debtor. You never were. It's fraud. Because you were the creditor for the first three years, how can you all of a sudden, the next 27 years, become the debtor? You signed on the right-hand side of that contract you didn't sign on the left hand, but they turned around, and as soon as the thing was settled, then they flipped you over to being the debtor, and then, because you don't know what the hell's going on, you continue to pay. Yeah. Pay. And, yeah. Pay. And everybody makes money but you. <laughs> yeah, basically, they're just taking it out of your back pocket because you haven't woken up. Well, <laughs> if you had a court case uh, on a foreclosure and you went ahead and submitted uh, your 1099-C, this is after three years now, 
uh, and uh, you went ahead and did a 3949A. Would you also CC a copy to the foreclosure uh, department of the judicial to let them know that you've canceled out the debt? Well, you keep the copies, okay? You send a copy to the foreclosure, whoever, uh, their copy, okay, as the borrower, okay, as the, cre as the debtor. That's debtor-creditor on that 1099-C. Mm. <laughs> you send the other copy into the IRS. You also utilize the 3949-A form to the IRS. Okay. And basically, those guys are scared to death of a CID showing up. I've already proven that with the secretary, with the treasurer of the state of Iowa. When I told him that I was coming to town and that I had already informed the CID that I was coming to town. I just did it just for my own protection so that they wouldn't harass me or anything like that, but they still had a couple of highway patrolmen uh, walk around with me while I was still up in the capital area. <laughs> I <laughs> What uh, that I've gotten to them. <laughs> um, now, let me just go go back and, and, and get this right. If you were to do a 1099-C, you'd make sure that, would that be your B or C copy that goes to the mortgage company, and your top copy would go with a 3949-A into the IRS to cancel the debt. Then do you do a second act like a 1099-A to acquire uh, or collect up the, the abandoned funds? You would turn around and uh, try and figure up out all the stuff that you had paid in, okay? Because, see, uh, the interest that they got off the wagering bet bonds that they placed was what fully paid for that house. So all the other money that you paid in there was under total fraud. Do you have to have a... When you do this, is it advisable to have a ten, uh, a Form 56 filled out and that you're acting yes. as a... Okay. That is your first thing to have filled out right now. Before you do anything else, you had better have that Form 56 filled out and you better have it filled out right. All right. And that's where you on line, part two, line 1C... You put down the date that you were assigned being the executor of that trust, that Social Security trust. And that is, should be the date that you turned 18. Now, you can't, you can't also do... go down and you mark out and say that you're going to terminate every other fiduciary out there so that you become the sole fiduciary over that Social Security trust. You can't do this for another person, can you? Act as a fiduciary for them? You could, but they would have to assign you that responsibility. So they would assign you that date as of today. So in other words, if you're going to work on behalf of somebody... When you look at line 1C, it says trust document or a amendment and that would be an amendment that basically they are going to amend their trust to allow you to be a trustee or to be a, a fiduciary over that estate or not a state that trust can it be limited to can it be limited to, like, say, for instance, you were helping somebody else, uh, and could you limit a, uh, a Form 56 on one Why trust? Why can't they do it? Uh, incompetent. It's just a signature. It's just a signature. You fill out the form for them and have them sign it. I see. Okay. Okay? Yeah. All right. Let them take the responsibility on to themselves. All right. Okay, if they want something, they better step up to the plate. I don't care how old they are. I'm going to kick my mom in the butt. And <laughs> he learns this stuff. I hear that. <laughs> and 
I think a lot, a lot of it's just taboo. People have got a lot of taboo about not being friends with the IRS, and so they've been offset to do anything. Of all the patriot bullshit that has gone around, and all these gurus that have gone around out here working for the other side, saying that there's a bad guy, there's a bad guy. People don't even know what the dollar bill says. In mm -hmm. God we trust. Yeah. What does that really say? Well, it really says in your soul's name. We have created a trust for you. Mm -hmm. And then you go over to the Great Pyramid, the all-seeing eye. Oh, that's nothing evil. That is really you looking at yourself. As soon as you understand that that is your capstone, you can acquire your capstone because <clears throat> the capstone of the Great Pyramid was solid gold. And basically, when Moses and the Hebrews left town, they took it with them. That the, gold belonged to them. Uh, the capstone on that dollar belongs to us. Because you're on that particular subject matter, uh, do you feel that uh, a person in any country around the world uh, that is associated with the IMF has the same opportunities that we have with doing this kind of paperwork? So anybody like Australia, anybody in Europe, they have the abilities to be able to file papers that are similar in nature with the IRS or the IMF over in their countries. They have the abilities to tap into these type of accounts that have been set up, set up in their name? Yep. Okay, so in other words, what you're saying, instead of fighting the system, is that we should join it and actually benefit from it. Well, we should learn what the system is. Yeah. We're not, we don't have to join it. We could come out of the system that is sitting there, but we have to understand the system before we can come out of the system and then protect ourselves once we do come out. Okay. So you have to put a little time and effort into understanding how the system operates. And then, yeah, we can come out of the system. We don't have to operate with their system. We'll operate with the real money instead of the fraudulent wagering money system. Um, did you uh, happen to put any, in the documents you sent, do you have any templates for people to simply create a living trust? They're on the site. They're in that uh, uh, 600 legal document form. Okay, all right, just checking, just checking, because uh, like I says, I've been a little sick last week. And... Yeah, they're real simple to do. Okay. I've told people that, uh, numerous times over just go in there and look at it it's your document you fill it out however you want mm -hmm. and uh, but you have to do a uh, living trust and then you do two copies of it uh, I put down three signatures my tribunal my uh, birth name Patrick uh, my uh, right hand person Patrick Divine and then my beneficial owner of the trust, Patrick Divine again, that's my tribunal, my three persons in one. And then I turn around and I put down my seal on there, which is my right thumbprint. I make two copies of that. I send one copy registered mail back to me uh, and unopen the envelope. Put that in a safe place. And then the other one I will have out at my disposal if I want to, if I feel that I need to show anybody, which I really don't have to because I'm going to make up another document called a uh, notice of trust. And that will just have the beneficiary's name and uh, the EIN number assigned to that uh, trust. And that will be what you could hand to the bank when you set up a bank account. I see. 
Okay. Um, in regards to the EIN number, uh, is that going to be a separate uh, number other than the Social Security number? <coughs> be an all new number. Yes. Okay. And then wh what do you do? You go for what is it? Uh, they call it an SS four. Is that what you're going for? Or is it CAP? When you file a CAP, do they issue you a brand new number? You can either. You should go and get it with an SS four. And I think I posted the number on the group. Okay. Uh, to call the number up to get the 98 series number or whatever number they want to give you. I see. Okay. You tell them you're setting it up for a non-withholding foreign grantor trust. And then that way it will be tax exempt. You shouldn't be paying any taxes anyway out of this because you're going to be using real money. And if you're using real money, it's non-taxable. Oh. The only thing that has to pay taxes <clears throat> is this wagering money system. So it, act, uh, it actually is kind of, because it's pure credit, it's untaxable, and it's also principal, isn't it? <clears throat> Just think of it as real money. Don't throw those other things in there. You'll, you'll confuse the hell out of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've got one uh, an additional. What is the current... Uh, website that you're posting the documents so I can actually put that over at Law Learners for everybody to be able to have that as a backup access. I'll send it over to you on Skype. Okay, good. All right. Um, let's see. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, otherwise, I'll complete this. Uh, no, that should be about it. Just listen to those last audios that I just posted up there and then go in and open up the document. Uh, learning the ABCs, which we were told to do when we were growing up. It does not have to do with the alphabet. It has to do with the 1099A, the 1099B, and the 1099C. Okay. It's that simple. All right. And then after you learn that, uh, the 1040 form and the 1041 form both say tax return. They don't say tax payment form, they say tax return form. We've been told all along, everything is taxes out here. Well, all transactions are basically classified as taxes. So, for us to move our money around, it's called a tax. We're taxing it from one place to the other. I see. Or taking a taxi cab. It's kind of like the, 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 the uh, tax stamps that they used to have. It used to be kind of like a mail system where it actually moves something from one place to another. Yep, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, just one last little quick question. Did you, uh, in regards to being able to do, do a 1099C, did you do a template that properly filled out with a uh, 3949A uh, so people can view that in order to cancel mortgage debt? I talked about it on the group. I uh, had one, I think I posted. I uh, have since, uh, over the last, I posted that about a week and a half ago. And um, from what you listen on the audio, it's going to be a, a little different than what appears on um, the templates that I have up there on the site right now for both the 1099A, the 1099B, and the 1099C. Uh, I and probably should just go ahead and pull those templates down right now. Okay, so it well, doesn't confuse anybody. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll go ahead and post that. It's going to take probably 24 hours to get this uh, all posted over at Law Learners, but you can also refer to to people that we're going to post that over there if uh, they can't get into the. Uh, do you, are you still maintaining a, a Yahoo group there? Yeah. Yeah. Now it's we the people <coughs> or shareholders. <coughs> it's we the people? You're going to send that to me, right? Or shareholders. We the people, shareholders. I'll send you the link here in just a second. Okay. Uh, and um, um, so one last question. I'll let you go. Um when you do a 1099c and you've got your uh, you got your form 56 you got the 1099c 
uh, you've got your 3949A. Do you add in the 1099A to call name it as abandoned that it needs to be returned? Do you put all that in one package? Uh, no. Uh, so you send uh, one 1096 with the 1099Cs. You send another 1096 with the 1099As. I could throw them all in the same envelope if you want to, but you've got to do a separate 1096 for each uh, different form. I see. And where does this go uh, when you're dealing with uh, concluding uh, debt, mortgage debt? Where, 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 what was the most likely, Ogden? Well, no, wherever uh, the 1096 says to send it to. Oh. All right. I think there's only about two places that those things get sent to. There's uh, uh, Kansas City and, uh, uh, well, you'll have to look. I think it's, I forget what it says on the other form. I know mine's Kansas City. All right. <clears throat> cool. All right, my friend. I think that that'll be a wrap. And, uh, yeah, so if you want to, if you get lined up to go on a show, let me know so I can post that over at Law Learns for people to be uh, abreast of it. They automatically get uh, whatever I post over there. They automatically get it immediately. It goes right to their email boxes, so they are, uh, you know, within probably uh, 12 hours. If you can give me a heads up, either that or just take a recording of whatever you got and send it to me, and I can post it over there. Yeah, well, that's what I tried to send over to you. I think you got most everything downloaded. Yeah. All right, brother. Talk to you after a while. Okay. Yeah, uh, bye. Bye.